Brutally Speaking podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. For over 30 years, Rockabilia has been the go-to destination for all things band merch. With over 500,000 items in their online store and collaborations with today's hottest bands, you're sure to find something you love. Use our code BREW10 at checkout and take 10% off your total order. So go pick up your favorite new piece of merch now over at rockabilia.com. Now, on to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John, and this episode's guest is the returning Chris Kelly. Yes, this is part two of our epic five and a half hour long conversation. Uh, if you listened to part one earlier this week, thank you so much. Hopefully you are champing at the bit to get into uh, this part two with Chris. Uh, this is the one, honestly, out of the two, not to negate what you spent two and a half hours listening to earlier this week, but this is the part I was really looking forward to. This is the part, honestly, it was kind of surprising that it took two and a half hours to get to this because this was really the crux of what I wanted to get into right away. Uh, but we just started talking. Uh, and that's sort of what happens with the show is, you know, I don't really kind of do anything. I tell the person, hey, I'm, I'm going to hit record and, and we're just going to go and, and wherever it goes is wherever it goes. And more to the point, it's it's also if you need me to keep track of time, let me know. And Chris had nothing to do and didn't tell me he needed to stop. And it's funny because there's an episode coming out in a few weeks uh, where the person uh, had the time. And then because of doing it basically on their lunch break, uh, they got a text uh, basically that they needed they were needed back at work. So sometimes it works where you get the full time and then some and then some and then some like this chat. And then there are other opportunities uh, to have people on and work calls and they 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 gotta go um but this one was really cool and i'm really excited to see what it does uh once it's released uh and the reaction it gets because honestly like it was funny doing the episode with andrew from from my dole dance gavin and him breaking down the cost of touring and you know how the band finances work for Idola, and not so much DGD, but you can probably get an understanding uh, of that from the same scenario that he laid out for for Idola touring and what it needs to do for for financials and so forth, and being on a smaller label and all that kind of stuff. So this is sort of the opposite side of that same spectrum of the conversation of what do we want from the band? What do we want for the band? And what is reasonable to expect at this point? And what are some of our non-negotiables and all those kind of things? And I, and I think, honestly, to see someone like Chris and the, and the people that are in his band having these conversations and navigating it are really interesting because these are the conversations that, and I hate to say it like this, but this is the conversation probably like my friends and I would have at a certain point of like, okay, we've you know, written songs, we're, we're, you know, playing all the local shows, we've built up a name for ourselves. Like, there just gets to be this this part of the story of, of when you start a band with friends, where it's like, this is kind of the other side of it, where it's like, okay, we got something, we're pretty good, now what does it look like to get over this next hump? What does it look like when you're when you're trying to traverse into that next level? And to me... Th- I don't have those answers. I mean, I think there are things that seem universally truthful uh, as to how you approach these things. But, you know, like some of the conversations I have coming up with some of these other bands, like, you know, I had uh, Haley from uh, Gore on and it's like that band hasn't existed for that long. They're now currently signed. They're about to drop, you know, a new album. They've only put out singles as, as as far as now, but they're they're in the brand building phase of that band and everything's happened pretty fucking quick. And so to me, that was sort of the interesting thing about most of that chat is how it kind of paralleled this one, but kind of picking someone's brain about why they chose to, to kind of go down the route that they did. And, and, you know, not every story is going to be applicable to everybody. So what works for Chris or what is not working for Chris 
it may work for you or it may not, but to gather the information from those in the industry that have tirelessly worked at their craft, uh, to carve out a career in doing what they're doing and has the knowledge that someone like Chris does. And like I said, the pedigree of the band, why wouldn't you want to ask them how they've traversed and why are they doing the things they are? Because there's got to be a rhyme or reason. And to me, that's fascinating and it's invaluable information that all it's costing you is the time to listen to Chris kind of talk about it. So all of that said, let's get into my conversation with Chris. Uh, let's get into this part two and let's really go down the rabbit hole of the music industry right here. I will talk to you on the other side of it. <laughs> Apparently, I think we're supposed to get some rain, so I think it's uh, getting a little darker out behind me. Oh, okay, I got you. I wish we would fucking get um, rain. It looks like I'm being raptured behind me, the fucking window. <laughs> Surprised you don't have a treatment over that, so you don't see any daylight at all. I'm I'm working on it. Yeah, it's it's on my list of just I keep I keep getting fucking called out to Asia and whatever, so I never have time to build it. Well, all you Could need. Be uh, Child labor, man. You just give uh, some some pretzel sticks. Yeah. <laughs> show, show, or, show them a drawing and be like, Daddy wants this. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, I was just in Jakarta, so I could, probably could have like paid a nickel to have somebody build them out there and I could have just figured out how to ship them home. But, dude, probably. Re- and it probably would have been really good. Real, real quick there. Um, so it's, it, it's the second time that I've been there, right? And I mean, I know that like the currency exchange is like pretty, it's like crazy, like in our favor there. Um, uh, for those who don't know, Jakarta is in Indonesia. Okay, um, I was just gonna say, and, I think it's in Indonesia. And, yeah, um, and it is vastly different from like if you go to Bali, that's like the capital. I think uh, like that that city rules. Like Jakarta is very much like like much more like in poverty and whatever. So, um, but like Indonesian currency to the dollar is like pretty heavily in our favor, right? Um, so I was at the hotel restaurant the first night that we got there and I was just like, fuck it, dude. I'm just so like, I'm ordering good shit. And so I ordered a steak. It was 347, three, oh dude, whatever it was three. So th- the price, the price that was listed on there was 347, whatever, whatever. Yeah. You know what that is for us? That's two cents, two, <laughs> two cents. Okay. Um, and now usually over there, uh, everything's done in like thousands, you know, like 347,000 like things. Oh, it's like a rupa. I was, I was close. I was funny earlier. I made a comment about ruble, rubles or ruples or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's Russian. almost close to yeah. the Indonesian. Yeah. The Indonesian uh, <laughs> currency. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking crazy. With that. But the thing is like, so, so. Now I haven't looked at my credit card yet. They could have charged me three hundred and seventy-four thousand as opposed to three hundred and seventy-four. But if they charge me three hundred and seventy-four thousand, it's like twenty dollars. So that's yeah. still like I ordered a fucking. It was like a three hundred gram ribeye, dude. <laughs> like so, yeah. even you know, even on the high side of things, I either paid two cents or paid like half of what a steak usually yeah. costs. Um, fuck. I think even. Like, I mean, that's. Uh, I feel like I, I, you were in the middle of talking though before, so I should feel like I should let you finish your your thought process uh, before you went and peed. <laughs> I mean, I think you uh, forgot. I think peeing was the thought process. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah, all of it just left. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, like. It- like I said, that you uh, there there's probably there's probably some points that you would hit that I that I've forgotten about now. But I mean, most of it was kind of centered around like, you know, sort of doing it for you, right? Um, and yeah. uh, uh, there's actually a there's a there's a video of me talking about this for you know, for the longest time I've heard people say stuff like that, um. And like in the band, like I've been in a band since high school called Illustrium, which is like a, like a technical death metal kind of thing. And, um, that's like, that's what I use now to keep my guitar chops up apart from the gig that I, that I play in. Um, and, uh, my, my other guitar player, my writing partner in that, in that band, and also my best friend of many, many years, um, has, he's very, 
very much in that headspace right and for that project for the most part i am too especially these days you know because it's just so much so heavily a passion project for the two of us um but even back in the day you know he was always like i'm just doing this for me he says what, what you hear a lot of artists say of like i know you know I, did, I didn't care whether you know whether anybody else liked it i just i just did it for me and i do think that there's a really important part like there 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 is something really important in, in that like you should like what you're doing um but ultimately i always had a hard time understanding it because i was like what the fuck is the point of making something if you're not going to share it with people you know so from the get-go like there there was a lot of intent behind this as you you know as you said like it's you know you got the impression of like there definitely was intent behind this even in the areas that like i or we as a group didn't really have any like knowledge about or that you know our knowledge was super super shaky on um but it was like you know uh, i've said a few times it just you know it, to the best of our ability like this this has to be done right or it's not going to be done at all and when it comes to the touring side of things it's going to be the same um you know and while 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 we all acknowledge that that may very well wind up you know, requiring, you know, fill-ins and, and stuff like that, um, depending on how frequently the band might get on the road and how busy everybody is and all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the, the base, the sort of baseline for the, the sort of touring mantra that we've got here is that it's got to work. It's got to work for us. You know, and I and and I don't mean that in an unrealistic way of, of saying like, oh, we got to make the big bucks or we're not coming. Right. I, I recognize that any tour that we do, we're going to be the first band on that tour, um, <clears throat> at least for a while. And um, but the, but the thing is, like, like we want to do we want to make intelligent moves. You know, we want to be on tours that we fit and where, it you know, it makes sense whether, you know, the the offer has to be good in some way like whether whether it's like oh we didn't expect to get offered this much money like even if it's not an insane amount like um it's either like oh wow okay yeah let's go do that or like um you know it's a fucking falling in reverse tour or some shit like that like some right. massive fucking thing right um and it doesn't have to be massive but you get my point right or it's like like right uh, and the cut and we, we've had we have had and are having conversations with booking agents at the moment we haven't landed on anybody yet but um but that's been the the kind of uh you know the foot down part of the conversation which so far everybody's been receptive to luckily I, no nobody has um nobody has told me i'm crazy which is nice um but uh that's that's been the whole thing of like it's got to make sense it, it, it's it has to it has to do something for the band and it has to not come at the expense of like our lives right um this isn't going to be something unless some insane shit happens and it fucking blows sky high and suddenly we're getting millions of streams and all kinds of crazy shit um, and now we're able to, to demand money and do big tours and, and whatever, um, you know, we're going to have like, it's, we're going to be doing it for, you know, for the love of it for the most part and, and, um, you know, be working it in with our schedules and, um, and so we want to make sure that it's like, okay, it, it makes sense for the band to go do this um right and like we'll we'll gain some exposure out of it we'll you know we'll probably sell some merch um and you know kind of like raise awareness quote unquote but it's not going to be something where like we're going to be on tour for eight months out of the year and just fucking grinding <laughs> grinding grinding and living in vans and whatever that's just not going to happen you know right well i mean because i think what kind of gets interesting and you know it's funny, like I said, like I, I like talking about these things, uh, more of the behind the scenes stuff, because to me, for the people who are listening to you because they know you who maybe are starting bands themselves, like this is this is the kind of stuff that no one used to talk about. And so you would just kind of be like, Well, how how the fuck do you get signed? Or how like what's important? What do you put like, okay, is it that we need to spend the money here or do we need to spend the money here? Or what is what does everything look like logistically? Um, and there's just wasn't information out for a long time, unless you were someone I would say probably like yourself, but you know, I can speak for me where it's like, I would watch like any behind the scenes thing of 
anything I could get my hands on. Same. Because I was like, oh, what's it like? What's it like being in the studio? Oh my god, that's so cool! How making the record of whatever. Yeah, I love that shit. And it's like, or even like hearing demos. Like when I started getting into booking shows, and I kind of, and I say this very loosely, there was a band that was here that I thought was doing really well. They wanted me to come on in like a managerial type role, and I was like, what does that look like to you? Because I think different people have an idea of what a manager is. And for them, it was like, well, we need help with booking shows. And I was like, well, that's more of a booking agent than a manager. And they're like, but you have good ideas that, you know, when I talked to like the main guy that was doing everything, he's like, when we talk like this, you have good ideas of like, why aren't you guys trying this? Why aren't you trying this? And you're just spitballing ideas. And a lot of it is me talking to my other friends who have achieved these different levels in the industry. And I go, so how did you do this? How did you know when this worked? How did you know when this was not working? How did you know when to fire this guy? How did you know when to let this person go? Like all the things associated with the business side of the, of being in a band or being in this industry. And so right. we tried a lot of things in this instance and, you know, a lot of them were working, but I found that they didn't, half of the guys and half the people in the band didn't want those things. They didn't want to be playing every, every weekend. They didn't want to be hitting the road. And it was like, kind of like you're saying where it's like, we're old, we got kids, man. Like, and I was like, Oh, I thought you guys wanted more because you believe so much in the music you were creating that you were like, sure. We think this is the time to fucking hit it and add some gas and whatever that looks like. We want to try to make a good run at this. And I put them, I don't even, I wouldn't even say I put them through the paces for three months. I think there was literally like a three week thing where I was like, okay, you're playing Detroit. You're playing Lansing the night before. Um, then we're playing here. Then we're playing here. And then we're doing a show trade with two of these bands. And you guys are doing a hometown show this day at this place, you know, da 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 da, da And like all this kind of stuff. And I was like, um, we're going to need to be active on socials. We need to, you know, push them as well. Uh, and this is sort of in the earlier days of Facebook and stuff. So you didn't have to pay for all of these things. Like whatever your reach was, was your reach. But I was like, look, unified across the board it can't be one person posting on facebook it needs to be all of you on all of your socials bringing everyone back there's there's five of you in one band page funnel five of you's people's worth and i very east coast right there use uh people of getting people to your thing if you give a fuck like who's gonna give a fuck about your shit if you don't if you don't seem right. interested why should i and so it got to a point where they're just like oh we're just not we don't want this out of it. And like the other right. part was they did a cover gig in between that paid them more than any show money. that they had ever made. And they were like, let's do this because they got it put up at a ski resort since we live here in Michigan for a weekend. And they're like, we should do this. We made money and it was cool. And then it's like, okay, it, I can't disagree cover, with that. But cover, at least, gigs, like, cover gigs are the, are the biggest killer of, of bands and i and i don't yep. mean that to shit on being a cover band like dude you make bank like you may yeah if you yeah. if you get a regular you get a regular gig and you're like playing those songs well you're killing it i mean dude look look at look at me even even ricky right like we how many of these songs have we written of the of the bigger bands that we play for right i think ricky said ricky's had more involvement with ice nine than i've had with any of the projects that, that the bigger projects that have and that's me and i'm not but discrediting but it's still not much yeah, this is a glorified cover gig, dude. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we're playing for the actual band, but we're playing songs that other people wrote. You know what I mean? Like playing mm -hmm. other people's shit is much more lucrative. That's just that's just a yep. fact. Um, and I, I like there, there will there there are some things that I will say here, like just so you know, because you sort of mentioned um uh you know things where like oh well if somebody has money or connections or whatever like that that helps now um and you're 100 percent correct um, but no one talks about to, that was my bigger point no one talks sure about that. sure but but like so okay so i i will say there's there's sort of there's something to be said on both sides right because people people have said this about the like, people like billy eilish and stuff like that of like oh her parents were rich and they were connected and they and and whatever i don't doubt those things right I, i'm yeah. not saying that i'm not saying that like no you know and i don't think billy's ever been like no i came from you know humble beginnings in the park. <laughs> yeah you know what i mean yeah. I, I don't think i don't think she's ever claimed anything like that i will say that like if you suck you suck right like yeah. e even if it's like 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 if my best friend is fucking jimmy iovine and uh and i go to him and i'm like hey i've got a band i want you to sign he might be like cool let me hear it but if it sucks he's not gonna fucking sign it yeah. right um right so that's really especially from from the band perspective that's all that that's the only kind yeah. of area that i can speak on um so it doesn't do nothing right experience money connections all that kind of stuff it doesn't do nothing um 
uh, like Hillhaven would not be on Octane right now if we didn't have the members that we have. Right. Right. Um, well, I, and I still go ahead. I was going to say, I just learned, and this is somewhat something I'd like to ask you about too, because I was shocked when I just learned this from a friend that's in a, a his main gig is a bigger band, arena band. Mm -hmm. And he kind of did a solo thing uh, in this last year and it got on Octane. And the day we were hanging out, he was like, oh, it's it was on their test drive, I think, and or whatever it's called. And I was like, dude, that's, that's fucking huge. Because like when we had done our podcast chat, like record wasn't out. I had the media link and all that. So like, you know, I had, I knew what was on it and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we were talking, but to hear him be like, Oh, we got picked up by, by Octane, like my solo shit. Like, and it's because the question I asked him is would success with the solo project mean more to you than any success you have in, in your main day to day gig, like your main gig. Yeah. And right. he was like, Oh, it's kind of hard to answer that because like, I haven't had that yet. I would assume it's all going to feel relatively the same. I probably would be more apt to say the thing I did. That's mine is going to give me more, you know, sure. Hit me a little differently because it's mine and it's more personal. But I think at the end of the day, like it's kind of hard to quantify wins and successes when they're all wins and successes and they all take a certain amount of sacrifice and, and all the things to, to achieve these, these things. And I said, okay, yeah. So fast forward like a month or two from the podcast to when we're in person before their show. And he's explaining like, we're on test drive. It's doing really well. And I was like, that's fucking awesome, dude. Like, how does it feel? And all this stuff. And that's when I was explained how that side of shit works now. Like we all know with terrestrial radio, it, it was kind of was a little bit of a pay to play kind of a thing where you get mm -hmm. paid for X amount of spins of this thing. And that's how you break artists and, and all that stuff. Octane and, and internet radio like that's kind of different. Um, you know, I've talked to some people who are like, it, it's, we don't get any money and that's not how this works. It's based literally on what do our statistics say? Like is, are the metrics showing that people are listening, not tuning out, da, 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 whatever. Octane, as I learned, at least with the test drive stuff was, okay, so you hit this. Now you're on it. The song did well. Now it has to perform and we want to see a growth of X amount over this amount of time of the single, or we won't pick it. Like we won't keep it on because we need to see that people are, engaged a week or so out that sure. the song is doing well on its own. And like all these side metrics that I had no fucking idea mattered for any of that. Was that kind of an eye opening thing for you of, and I don't not getting too specifically into like your, your uh, stuff like that, but it's like, I didn't know that's how octane <clears throat> worked. So when they, when this person explained that to me, I was like, Oh shit. So <laughs> Just getting there, getting to the dance isn't enough. And it, and it can't just perform well. It has to perform well over a sustained period of time with incremental growth, not only for them, but on your own stuff. Otherwise, they'll just look at it as, well, no one's interested, so we don't want it. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean- That was eye-opening to me. Yeah, well, the, the thing that you got to think about with any radio, I mean, like you said, terrestrial radio has kind of become its own thing, right? Um, but even, even with terrestrial radio, like let's say there's a, a band that's big- that puts out a song that just automatically goes to terrestrial radio, but it's not the band's biggest song. Well, it, they're probably, it's probably not going to be on there for as long. Right. Cause the thing, so um, with, you know, without getting too deep into the weeds on it, real estate is inherently more valuable um, on a radio station than it is on something like Spotify. Right. Because anybody in the world can use Spotify from anywhere in the world for the most part and listen to anything that they want. That's why, and there's billions of fucking songs on Spotify. So that's why a stream on Spotify is like a third of a penny, right? Because market value is dog shit on a stream for Spotify. It just is. Um, uh, so it terrest any kind of radio, especially if it's a station with high listenership like Octane, um, is inherently more valuable and, and not only to the artist, but to the radio station, especially and to, 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 you know, the, the parent company like Sirius, right. Um, because they only have 24 hours in a day and they only have so many songs that can be played within those 24 hours. Right. So it can't just be, and it's non-interactive, right. People aren't just picking like the, obviously there's a, there's programmers, but I'm saying like the listeners aren't picking, they're not hitting a button and then that song comes on. It's not a jukebox, right? So right. the songs, the songs that end up on the biggins list and the songs that get high requests and stuff, that you know, yeah, those have a lot of a lot more staying power and a lot more longevity and therefore a lot more value to the station. Um, because 
it shows them that because they're required, those like Sirius and 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 Pandora and things like that, they're required to pay out a certain amount of their revenue that then gets distributed amongst the artists that are that are played on their stations. Um, they want to make sure that that money is going to a good place. You know, they want to mm. make sure that that money is going somewhere that somebody cares about, that, that people give a shit about. So, um, you know, we've we've been fortunate that and and also I should I should I should point out that the last two of our songs that have been on Octane, like we we haven't hit the biggins list. Like, I, I don't I don't know how close we are. I don't know. I don't know how many plays you have to get to to hit the biggins list. For all right. I know, it's I think it's top 15. For all I know, we could be 16 or 200. I have no fucking idea. Um, <laughs> but we have we have not made that list. And I don't necessarily expect to make that list. Um, but that being said, like, it does help that we're putting out a new song every month right now. So right. I'm I'm willing to bet that if we just put out gaps and, you know, Vinny likes the band and he wants to help it and whatever. And that's a real that's a really helpful thing. And that's really good. But if the song tanked or, you know, it it did OK and people liked it, but they weren't fucking screaming for it. I I don't know that it would still be in regular rotation right now. Um, right. Uh, you know what I mean? But, yeah, it's just the, the, the not to not to you know beat a dead horse with this same fucking phrase. But real estate on radio is more valuable than it is playing somewhere else um so that's why that's why it it, it matters and that's why they track all of those things and and they want to make sure that people actually care whether it's a good song or not they, they want to make sure that people care about it and want to hear it because otherwise it's not it's not worth the portion of their money that they're going to have to be paying out at the end of the day right um <clears throat> so um yeah so that that's why that kind of stuff matters um and the weird there are oh, weird go, oh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead okay uh, no i was gonna say it's weird weird oh sorry <laughs> the nice delay between <laughs> the, the delay yeah the delay no no no. all right i i yeah. i i'm um uh i i final answer you go okay so in all of this it, it, it literally you probably just saw me come up with this question but it was something as we as we're literally talking about kind of being a baby band in essence and how to traverse what you're looking to get out of it for yourself, for the career of the brand, whatever, was potentially the idea not to be to self-release all of this so you owned and could recoup more money, whatever the money is that's coming in, to be able to recoup it a little bit faster to then put it out. Like so the the process is like it's not getting diluted down. And then you're like, well, I'd really like to do whatever but I have no money and then I have to go to somebody else because the reason I just kind of stumbled across that when I, when I just was realizing that you said that you hadn't put any, like didn't sign anything and all that. I just was looking at the DSPs and I was like, Oh shit, you haven't. I didn't re didn't put that together. Uh, even though you kind of have said it a couple of times, but looking at your, your DSP stuff, it reminded me when Josta on his show used to bitch all the time. You, the, the artists get fucked on payouts and royalties and all this kind of stuff. The artists get fucked. The artists get fucked. It needs to change. That was his MO for like three years on his podcast. And then he put out a solo record where he owned everything and suddenly his tune changed and it was, well, it's actually not that bad when you own everything. It's a pretty good chunk of money. And so it's been funny right. to, to see how he has changed. So as soon as you it clicked in my head that you're not on a label and you were talking and we've been discussing finances of, of being starting something and, and how do you navigate where to put it when to kind of hold off not over exerting yourself or overextending in any way shape or form that part of me was like was that part of the conscious decision of why you're not on anything because then your internal revenue comes back to you a lot faster is not diluted to where then you can now have a, an income source to then stream it to put into a music video, to put in somewhere else. So now not only do you not have to ask a label or a finance person or the other guys in your band, but now you don't even have to pay for it out of your, as much out of your own pocket. Is, is that kind yeah. of a, was that a concerted? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And, and, uh, it's, it's good that you asked that question. Cause that's kind of, that's part of where I was going anyway, in, ter okay. in terms Sorry. of, Sorry. You, you, you were, you were mentioning, you were, you were mentioning, no, it's fine. You, you were mentioning, um, you know, like bands, 
or, or members of bands saying we want this when it's when when they would what they really want is something else because they just don't they don't exactly know what it means and and i think um you know we've been talking for almost four hours now if there's one like if you got to make serious edits to this episode and there's one chunk to keep i think this would like start being the the area that we keep because in terms of people that are that are trying to start their own project let me just say really quick um take notes from falling in reverse um they're not the first band to do this but they're currently i think one of the most successful to be to to have done it and i sort of i sort of mentioned it a little bit ago about how the title track of the record came out four years ago <clears throat> when you put out a song it has something called an isrc code attached to it it's basically it's basically the song's vin number whatever you want to call it it's how it's how all of the tracking metrics on all the different streaming platforms know what how to report right the song has a code attached to it so that it knows what it's looking at if you put out a single and that single gets a hundred million streams and then you put that single on an album it's the same isrc code just from that one song i didn't alone, know that right? until recently one song one one song alone boom 100 million streams instantly yep. because it carries over from that same isrc code okay so yep. that's why only three of the songs now falling in reverse is fucking massive they probably would have hit number two without that right i'm not saying that like oh it's like some hack and they fucking faked it like th that dude has earned everything that he's built okay um yeah but uh but that but that's a big that's it's i won't say it's like oh that's the only reason it did good i'm saying that's why he did it that way i guarantee you um because they've just been putting out singles and the singles have been blowing up, blowing up, blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. And they're that they put out what, like like seven of them now or something like that. Eight of them put all eight of them onto a record and another three that people hadn't heard before. I'm sure those three are getting yeah. their own fucking massive bits of streams. Right. Um, or maybe it was four songs. Doesn't matter. Uh, the the the, right. the minority of the songs on there are songs that people haven't heard before, and all of the songs people have heard before have gotten hundreds of millions of streams in the in the years that they've been out. So that album in, instantly instantly got was was at eight hundred million streams or some crazy crazy amount like that because they had done the work beforehand. Um. So uh. So like taking notes on like what could be considered unconventional things like that is really important. And um, to sort of bring it back to what you were talking about um, in terms of like intentionally not signing with a label because of financial things and whatever, that definitely was a big part of the conversation. And you hear people say stuff like that a lot of like, Oh, well you don't need record labels now and blah, blah, blah. They kind of, they kind of poo poo the whole thing. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think that it's valid to say that you don't need a record label, right? I would certainly be able to, facilitate a lot more things for this project if i had the resources of a record label behind me and there's concessions that i have to make as a result of not having those resources so there definitely is a trade-off there and you get a signal boost right like you you know our the sycophants video has like seven and a half thousand views on it right now and from the last two weeks it's it's tough to break on youtube everybody knows that um uh, especially when you've only been out for like four months um so uh but if we had put it out on fucking fearless or something probably would have gotten a hundred thousand views um right and like and so so you get a massive signal boost because they already have the viewership they already have the following they already have the consumers trust they are they all they all have that stuff ready to go and that's part of the reason that you that you sign with a record label is so that they can basically include you with they can you know bring you into the party right um so they still play a very valuable role i'm not knocking record labels at all but objectively like and this is something one of the i mentioned eric german the other person that i've been kind of um you know taking advice from on all this is uh jb from august burns red um he really likes the project obviously our the live debut is on his show in december um and he's been a, you know a, a very uh valuable you know it, 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 for nothing for nothing if for nothing else advice you know a, va a very valuable source um when putting this stuff out and he's also a, a, an, been an artist manager for a long time he and brent self-managed that band and have done so for uh on nearly a decade at this point i think um yeah and uh and one of the things that he said to me like when we were talking about the label thing i was like 
you know, he was like, well, you know, you give up a much bigger piece if you sign to a label. And a lot of, he said, you know, myself included, a lot of artists that signed to labels early on kind of wish that they had waited. And I said, yeah, I know that. I just, I, I said, I, ultimately though, like as long as the project does well, like if it's a result of, you know, I gave up a slice in order for the project to do well, then like, I'm okay with that. I don't really care so much about that. And he goes, you'll like care. Surfing. if it, Yeah. He goes, you'll care if it blows up, dude. You know, that was what he said. Yeah. And, and I, and, yeah. and I was like, yeah, that's probably true. You know, um, <laughs> you know, so, so you got to work harder to get it not necessarily work harder, right? Because if you sign, if you sign to a label, especially a bigger one right out of the gate, they're going to be like, okay, tour, 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 tour. So you're going to work your ass off no matter what. And you probably worked your ass off just to get that record deal. So like, I'm not saying that like, oh, there's no work involved if you signed to a label. I'm just saying that like, there's the work is different, right? Um, and, yeah. uh, and you, and you, as I've said, have to wear more hats than you might ideally like to um, uh, in order to preserve that. But now, like, you know, let's say by the end of this year, you know, the band's got a good buzz around it. The live show goes well, God willing. Um, and uh, and now we got some people calling. Right. Well, now, like if you're in that position, you're able to basically say, well, we've done all of this on our own. What is it that you're bringing? Right. And that's mm. not in like an that's not in an insulting way. That's just like like it's just business. Right. It's like, OK, well, we were able right. to we were able to set all this up and we were able to handle the release plan and we were able to get distribution and we got ourselves on octane and we've been selling X amount of merch and um, you know, and like things are rolling and you know, we're you're talking, you know, we've got this booking agent lined up X, Y, or Z. We're doing this tour next year, whatever it's going to look like. Um, where do you come in? You know what I mean? Cause it kind of seems right. like we've done, we've done a lot of the legwork that we would have expected you to do. So at that point it becomes, um, it, at that point, it's on the label to to prove why you should work with them instead of why they should work with you. And just and, and I mean, that's a no that's a no brainer. Like if you just take the context out of it and you just say, well, what's better in a business negotiation? Would you rather have the leverage or have the other person have the leverage? They're going to everyone's going to choose themselves every time. Right. So. Right. um so that's a really important thing. And, and that, I mean, that comes down to everything, right? I mentioned JB's an artist manager. I, I was talking to him about him managing Hillhaven. And when I, and, and um, so we got on a call, this was early um, uh, in our, you know, discussions. And I told him everything that I had laid out. And he's like, dude, you don't need me right now. You know, um, and that's not I'm not like tooting my own horn. Obviously, like, you know, Eric had helped me sort of put together a lot of stuff. But he was like, he was like, you've kind of put a lot of the pieces together. And I don't think I don't think you should go for a label right now. I think it's too early to do that. Like, I, and I think you guys will probably get a decent amount of buzz on your own. So like, he's like, let's just just, you know, let's let's hold off. Like, let's see where this goes, because that's the thing. Like a, a, for anybody that doesn't know any any, you know, aspiring artist or a band that's, you know, grinding or working you know trying you know they want a manager they want a label they want a booking agent if you get a manager that's 15 percent of your income right and uh you've probably heard people say this before but it cannot be said enough if a manager asks for a monthly fee that is not a manager okay that is a con artist um that is not anybody that is worth working with and if it is somebody that's worth working with that's their way of telling you that you're not worth working with because you're not going to be gay, you're not going to be earning enough money for them to 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 uh make sense to work on a percentage okay so if you are a band that is worth managing and are talking to a manager that is worth letting manage you they work on 15% or sorry 20 might be 20 might be 20 now um there's probably fit probably 15 percent back you know like you know eight eight years ago with the last time that i was negotiating yeah. with a manager so i don't a bunch of managers out there might be like this fucking guy um <laughs> uh no so probably so, yeah, so probably about pro probably about 20 let, let, let's just say 15 to 20 percent right if you find if you find right. a manager that's you find a manager that's like a homie or is like hungry or or whatever willing to cut you a deal they might go 15 most of the time it's 20 um i'm glad yeah. i remembered that. um 
So uh, they, they <laughs> there will be people that shut off the podcast when I said 15%. I guarantee it might not be a lot, but there might be like one guy who's like, oh, he's an idiot. Never mind. Um, I agree. He had me when he said, you know, my son squared up to me and I was like, you motherfucker. But as soon as he said 15%, I, I, two and a half hours later, I was done. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He had me three hours ago talking about hitting kids. Um, uh <laughs> sorry uh no it's fine um but yeah manage a manager will work on a percentage every time if yeah it's, if it's worth both of your time um but so that's it that's that's not nothing right 20 now obviously 20 percent of zero is zero so if the manager can facilitate more paying opportunities for you then that's something to consider um but right. bands bands think that they need a manager because they think a manager is gonna like fix it you know, like they're like the manager just has all the answers. And I mean, sometimes they do have a lot of answers or they know the people who have the answers. But you have to already be like an operating business, you know, to some degree. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have to be making enough money where giving enough giving 20 percent is like is some level of income for this person. Um, the same thing right. goes for a booking agent. Uh, a booking agent is 10%. I know that. <laughs> um, a booking <laughs> agent does 10% and it's only of the stuff that they facilitate, right? So like mm -hmm. if you, like if, if you know, right now we haven't landed on a booking agent. If I hit up a friend of mine and then go, hey, can, we, can you throw us on one of your tours next year? And they go, yeah, sure. And then we sign to a booking agent. That booking agent is not entitled to ten percent of the tour that I facilitate. Right. right. It's only the stuff. It's only the shit that they submit and and reel in. Um, and same thing. The good ones will not. The, the good the good ones will not ask for anything else. Um, right. A, a label is even bigger than that because a label, especially if it's a traditional deal, if it's a licensing deal, like for instance, my, my death metal band, Illustrium, like we're on a label called unique leader records, which is not, mm -hmm. uh, not enormous, but not nobody either. Um, yeah. And, uh, and we have a licensing deal with them. So that's a 50, 50 deal. So they, you know, like they get 50% of the money, we get 50% of the money and we're comfortable with that because they, they handle all of the marketing for us. We do the, I, I do all the production and, and we do the, you know, all that kind of shit in house. So they pay for the video and they pay for all the, the marketing and advertising and they handle, you know, the printing of the merch and the distribution and all that kind of shit. Um, and uh, so we're comfortable with that arrangement and it's worked out decently for us. You know, we got, it, it, it took a couple of years to come in, but like we, we got a, you know, a not so insignificant chunk of change um, for a death metal band that doesn't fucking tour. Right. Uh, from, from the last record that we put out. Um, but when you get into a traditional record deal, that's something where, well, now the label owns the rights to your masters most of the time in perpetuity. Um mm -hmm and uh and the royalty rate is pretty nuts you know you get i think i think now it's it used to be like oh this is like high but now i think it's pretty standard that you're getting like 17 percent, like as the artist um you have like a 17 percent royalty um and what and the biggest thing is regardless of what your royalty rate is even if it is 50 um what most people don't know is that that's after recoup recoup well no so yeah. well so oh, I, let me let me let me rephrase that so you don't start seeing any money until the label recoups until it's recouped right? yeah right yeah. until yeah so so un until until the label however much money they put in it they put five hundred dollars or five million dollars into your thing until they make that money back you're not seeing a dime now your recoup rate is your royalty rate so what i mean by that is that so let's say the label puts in ten thousand dollars and then day one, your album gross is $10,000. You're not recouped. You only have a 17% royalty rate. So you have now recouped 17% of that $10,000 on that first day. So my point is that your royalty rate is what goes towards your recoup. It's not just, it's not just based on gross income. Okay. So right. they're making money a lot quicker than you are. Because until <laughs> until you're like, because they can still see profit, but like technically, because they put X amount of money in, the venture isn't profitable yet. So, right. so you know, you're if you have a major, you know, or a mini major behind you, and they put fifty thousand dollars into your band, 
and you get that 17% or 15% or whatever the fuck it is. I haven't signed a record deal in a few years, so it could be different now <laughs> um, as far as the royalty rate is concerned, you know, but like, um, but that's more than likely what it's going to look like um, is yeah. that your, your, let's call it 17, your 17% of every dollar is going to be going towards your recoup, not every dollar, you know? So um, that's, and then, you know, if the project does blow up, like if you're if you're doing millions of streams and you're playing uh, and you're you're on every major radio station across the country and you're number one on the biggins in octane and um and you're playing arenas and you're fucking killing it in merch and something like that but you signed a deal when you were younger and hungrier and you took a 12% royalty rate and you and you they own your masters in perpetuity and you have a 10 record deal with them you know, that's an album every two years. That's 20 years, homie. Like that's, that's a lot. And, and it's a lot of money that is not yours now, you know? So, um, again, this is not, this is not a, um, this is not an indictment of record labels. This is not a, a, a seminar on why you should not sign with a record label. I'm just saying this is all like when people say you don't need a manager yet, you don't need an agent yet. You don't need a label yet. That's not, that's not entirely them. Like it might be like, you're not ready or it might be like you suck. Right. right? Um, <laughs> but, but assuming that like, assuming that, you know, cause you, this doesn't go for everybody, but you can generally tell if you've got something decent, right? If you have, if you have relatively Hopefully. good taste in music. Yeah. If you have relatively good Plus taste, in music, yeah, <laughs> right. And, and you're putting it and you're, and you're like honest with yourself and the stuff that you're putting out is, you know, you think relatively on par with the other stuff in your scene and, and you're getting engagement and people seem to enjoy it. And when you play shows, people come out to them and people buy your merch and stuff like that. Like you're onto something, right? It's still going to be a fucking fight, but you're onto something. So, um, uh, but you, so if you're, if that's you and somebody tells you, you don't need a manager yet, you don't need a label yet. It's because there isn't enough there isn't enough money coming in right now to make it worth it for you or for them and it's and it's the um the for them part is mainly for the manager for the label they're going to make the majority of the money anyway so you know if you're okay with that then fucking go for it and i mean in a lot of times like smaller artists and stuff if you i mean look at a band like bad omens now they're buddies of mine i have never i have never asked them about the details of their contract and i don't think i ever will it's not my business um but uh but i i mean i imagine that whatever their contract may have looked like when they signed to sumerian whether that contract lapsed or not and it was time to renew or if it's still going that band has now done well enough and gotten big enough that they can go back to the negotiating table and be like hey this is no longer uh proportionate right. deal right so right. there are there are ways to sort of um correct the course later on um and sometimes if you're a, if you're a small artist and you kind of feel like a nobody but there's a, a label that you know and like that's like yo we really like your shit it might be a good idea to just fucking jump on it and take it but what i'm saying is there needs to be an educated decision right um so yeah that's well, my because i think the, the other thing that gets the other yeah, the other thing that gets interesting about all this is like because i feel like we're seeing this for uh, i feel like a multitude of reasons uh if i had to if i were to literally ask any of these people who are doing this i'm sure part of the response is going to be probably some semblance of this which you're seeing a lot more re-records of old material mm -hmm. if i had to guess one of a few things is happening at that point the sunset clause is up on that and now you're able to realize that if I do this and put it out myself through a new venture, whatever, I recoup all of that and I don't Taylor have to Swift, fucking pay Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift. I <laughs> sure there's that, or I would even look at like the Emory guys that were mm -hmm. on, you know, I think at this point they have now that they have the capability themselves uh, and know how, cause they, they for a while were not on a label and were self-funding like crowdfunding their records uh, and owning everything and then doing, you know, like they played my basement a couple of times, uh, doing self-funded like acoustic tours and all that. Um, that it's like, they kind of were kind of, at the, in my opinion, one of the first to really be like, okay, we're not on a label anymore. It kind of sucks that our, our terms probably were awful. Cause we were just coming out of, you know, college or college age 
and we're just like, we want to be on a label and this person's willing to fund us essentially. Yeah. And you know, some of our biggest albums are the first ones we did and we're not making the money maybe that we feel like we deserve. These are my words, not theirs. Um, and you know, now at this point, I think they have literally gone through and anything that was on a label before they have gone back and re-recorded and done like a live version of it. And that's how they record it. Some of them in as like an, in a full live version. Um, I know they did that with the question, I think just recently, like recorded as a live album. Um, mm -hmm. and that's what exists now as their version of, of that album. <clears throat> and it's interesting to see, because I think a lot of people are like, well, we like the old version. And it's like, you a hundred percent probably will like the old version. Cause there's sentimentality, sentimentality attached to it and nostalgia and memories. But from a business perspective, probably should listen yeah. to the other one. If you really like this band, cause that's how they're going to make their money moving forward with these sure. re-records and all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting because, like, I just saw you, you know, bringing up JB. He's been on the show a couple of times. Um, I should have him back on. I enjoy talking with him. Um, Make him talk about But it's my a thing band. where. My band. Okay. And we'll talk baseball because he's a Phillies fan and I hate the Phillies as a Braves fan. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Phillies fan by default because that's where I grew up. It's a painful existence. I mean, I grew up a Phillies fan because that's the only team close to me in Delaware. But uh, when I was able to have my own opinions and thoughts on a team, I picked a, a team that I. For as much as people were like, they're a really good team. I was like, we were for a couple of years in the 90s, like when I kind of hopped on. And there's a good stretch where it's like, what are we doing this year? We're getting to the playoffs and winning the division and then getting booted out right away. That's not even worth it because like you're not getting anything of value in that <laughs> as a sports you know, model, it's, it's, as a business not, model. Not to, get, not to get too far on a sports tangent, but the thing is I've never been like crazy invested in sports. Like I, I don't mm. really watch many of them, but so there's no reason that I should feel this way, but my dad, yeah. my dad always like, he, he would always say like, like if, if there was somebody who like they're born in Philly, but then they decide that they're a, uh, a, a fucking Tampa Bay fan that he's like, he, his word, he was like, that's a violation. That's a, like, he would say that he would say that every time that's a violation. You can't do that. Like they're basically, basically like yeah. there's no, uh, there's no honor in that. And for some reason, dude, I die on that Hill. Like my, like my mother, my mother-in-law was a patriot. Oh, it, this is what's doing. It. <laughs> <laughs> for those who heard two hours ago when the fucking balloons showed up, I just put, I just put, you weren't holding balloons. <laughs> I just put my thumb on the screen and a thumbs up bubble showed up and now it's not happening anymore. I don't fucking know. Um, but my mother-in-law uh, was a big patron. AI doesn't fan. want you to know that you're alone. Yeah. That's <laughs> a um, Phillies fan. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a good job. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so my, my mother-in-law, I don't know what what team she liked before, but I know that she suddenly started liking the Patriots and then suddenly became a Tampa Bay fan when tom brady, brady when, when brady moved yeah. into that and i was I, like to this day dude i'm like that's a fucking that's cheating it's a violation like you can't do that and like i don't watch football <laughs> like, so, <laughs> um, so i'm a phillies fan and an eagles fan and all that and a flyers fan regardless because i just can't bring myself to go like i'm just like i barely like it to begin with i'm not about to go start with another team you know right no that's at least been like it's it's so weird because like and this sort of, I guess, actually speaks sort of, I can, I can correlate it to what we're talking about. Um, it's always interesting to me when people are just call it a spade a spade, a fair weather fan. Like I, I totally get, you can like your player. And if a player was like for me, Deion Sanders is why I got into baseball. For some reason, I just gravitated to Deion Sanders at the time he happened to play for the Falcons and the Braves. I stayed with the Braves. It didn't hurt as a kid that they won the world series and were constantly in the thick of it. Um, and had great players uh, at the time. So, but I stuck it out. Uh, obviously, wasn't a Falcons fan. Uh, I just thought it was cool that him and like Bo Jackson were playing two sports. Um, and I, for as much as this isn't me, like I'm not a flashy bravado y type guy, those are oddly the players I gravitate toward. Like, so Dion being like all these, I hate to say it like this, all these woke people who are like, Dion Sanders is a fucking bitch and like he's all about himself. And I'm like, yeah, he always was. I mean, he played in a team sport, but like he knew that he was so good at his position, especially in football. Like I can turn the game around being me and being as good as I am. And also, like, what do you, what do you want, dude? 
You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, like this is a, this is a professional athlete. Like this is, yeah. this is somebody who wears a funny outfit and does something with a ball better than you for way more money than you could ever hope yeah. to like what do you what do you want out of them it's the same like just correlating it back to music it's the same people like look i understand if you think ronnie radke is an asshole i don't understand if you're like he shouldn't be allowed to do whatever like i think we need the internet villain you know what i mean like yeah. i like i i didn't watch wrestling but well, uh, but people and i was in just gonna say as a wrestling person yeah they love they love the heel. Bad, bad guys yeah, yeah you need the heel you know what I mean? And like that dude's smart. He fucking knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? So especially like, with a wife like, in that yeah, industry. Right. You know girlfriend. what I mean? Like so people get so people get so uptight about all that shit about celebrities. It's like it's like, wait a second. Like you, you mean you don't like that your rock star acts like a rock star? You know what I mean? Like this this fucking like crazy looking larger than life, biggest guy in the fucking scene, whatever. You're just like oh, he got mad on the internet. I don't like him anymore. Like, what the fuck? You, you know, the same thing that you know, people don't like that Daniel Tosh had a bit about it years ago when they when they were out, uh, outlawing um, like celebrations in the end zone. It's like, yeah. I don't care if you, I don't care if you get into the end zone, you have a fucking 10 minute tea party. It's a game. Like, yeah. <laughs> why does everyone <laughs> care about this shit? Well, I think like that's, that's a bigger thing. And I feel like I'm, that was like one of the perks of, of changing the name with literally my face and name on it to, to this, even though literally I'm still my face and name on it. It's just me. Um, but they're sort of like, you can hide behind the, it's a brand, it's a thing and it's not me. It could be a few people that are working on this behind the scenes. You don't know. Um, there's been a few times, like even at whatever little bit of success, fame, whatever this has afforded me, <clears throat> it kind of came. There's been two instances now that have been like really, really, really fucking wild. Um, and they both involve my wife. Like one of them, someone when I was still using a Skype, and this is literally the only time I've ever, I think, ever talked about this. Um, but I had a Skype phone number that I paid for to do these when phoners were more the way you did this way mm -hmm. back in the day when I started. And no one other than like an Amy or you would ever know what it is because you're like you as the guest who may be calling me or me calling you, you only need to know it to when it comes up, like, hey, this is who this is, pick it up. Sure. Yeah, potentially someone in the publicist side of things, they would need to know to pass the information along to you. That's the quite only people who ever know. Yeah, yeah. I, it wasn't like an extra phone number I used to call people or text or whatever. It was only used for that one purpose. So one day I had a, a text uh, when I popped on um, at like a day or so after doing one, and I was getting ready to hop on for something. I think to maybe download the file, um, and someone was like, "How's your wife doing?" And like called her by name and I was like, fine. They're like, oh, did you guys have a good time at the bar that we were at? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, oh, I could still smell her on my fingers when I fingered her in the bathroom. And like, first of all, like I know my wife well enough to know that that's not a thing. And also that bathroom that this person is talking about is a bathroom that she barely wants to go into as it is because it's so tiny and full of hoes that are taking photos and shit. But also so, that escalated quickly. Oh, <laughs> real quick. And the what thing was, the is it wasn't, it wasn't from a number or anything that I recognized. And I was like, okay, so this person know, and not that like the places in, in my wife's name are like top secret. Like I, you know, sure. if you follow me on anything, I'm pretty open about those things. And the one bar is eventually the bar I work at. And it is literally the home bar I go to probably a few times a week. Um, sure. But it's a thing where it's like, I don't know who this was. I don't know how they got the number to, to contact me. And then put all the said information together to where it's like, okay, it's not a bot or a, a person fucking with me through the podcast, but somehow had like knew that I was there the night before, even though I didn't post anything about it, like all this kind of shit where it's just like, That's huh. shit, dude. and then, yeah. And then it was just kind of like this thing. And then I like told my wife about it and she was like, do you know who it is? I don't know who that is. And I was like, I, I don't know, but it really made me start not wanting to be as personable about my own life and my experiences and shit because i was like mm -hmm. that sucked and that's and i'm like nobody so like if people are doing that shit to me like what the fuck and then like i had someone that i i don't know what the ultimate goal of this was they never contacted me they texted my wife from an email you know how like if you have iphones you can yeah, get emails yeah. as text messages and she had gotten one that someone had a screenshot 
of me screen of me um apparently reaching out to someone like a hooker or something and my wife's like what's this and i was like i don't know who's it from and she was like i don't know it's from an email and i looked at the email address and it had like one name in it the supposed text exchange from me and whoever had a completely different name and then they were using a different name in that so there's three names that this one person's using and we're like what is this right. and then she's like is that you like and it was my phone number so there's no denying that but i was like what the fuck and then like and then i'm kind of like stressing because i'm like what what the fuck is this and i remember her and like all of our friends that we were hanging out with at the at the bar same bar looked at it and they're like that's not how you text because <laughs> it was like a paragraph yeah. and i do text like in paragraph form but they're like i text a very specific way and so just the phrasing of words and shit was like not me clearly like in and then me being me i was like let me go because i after i've had a bunch of friends and family die i don't i try not to delete text messages so at least i can go back sure. through and look at them and so i went through my wife's text message my wife and i's text messages and it was like six months back when and i was like also why the fuck is someone texting you six months after i did something <laughs> like what is right. that proving or doing but regardless so i went through my wife and i's text messages and i was like oh my god so they said that I sent that message at da 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 time. And she was like, yeah. And I go, that was the day I got my two new, two new mixers at work. And I stayed late to set them up. And then I had to make an ink at the last minute too. And I go, and then, uh, so that was at this time. And I go, and then I came home and 20 minutes later was walking at the dog and complaining about how I got stuck in the rain. And then you and I were going on and on for probably 10, 15 more minutes about what pizza we wanted to order from and that you were home. So I go, so where in any of that, did I have time to, to go do when it's all been accounted for digitally here and I can pull my phone over and show you like the timestamps of the day and the time. And right. she was like, Oh yeah, that's true. So it's funny that I'll never forget that of like the day that I got those mixers at work because it's the day that apparently I was trying to have sex with someone that wasn't my wife. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, with uh, like, I won't get, I won't get too into the, into the thick of it, but uh, during uh, 2022, I had some not dissimilar experiences mm. uh like just actually people get people people complete strangers being very very invasive and i mean that shit i and I'm, I'm and i'm recently, no i'm that's nobody a, well, i was gonna say i just heard recently for whatever this is worth and it ties back kind of to what we were saying earlier someone was saying that this was sort of i don't want to call it a, a spam or like bot activity but a friend of mine actually was like oh because we we figured out that she had had something similar happen with like it was supposedly an ex but it mm. wasn't yeah. um and apparently we all kind of put a lot of this together that every one of us that had a, a, a situation like this we all had at&t and then with the data leaks or whatever we we're like oh i wonder if that's potentially oh. a weird thing that's been happening to us is like just phishing scams for lack of a better term or something like just weird right. shit um so i don't know if you have at&t but i would be I interested to see if that oh well then yeah, maybe the, so the, that might that could be that could be it yeah okay wow. 18t's out to ruin our marriages <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember sure. signing up for that as my on my plan well you no know, we we never read the terms of service right <laughs> so, no, <laughs> there, no. so it's in there yeah if you failed if you're late one day by missing your payment we're gonna try to break up your marriage <laughs> right <laughs> and then we get then we get two 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 uh plans out of you <laughs> right, right. it's not i mean it's not a terrible business strategy no not at all um so i had two things and i'll finally let you go um and thank okay. you so much for the time i know it's i'm yeah, sure yeah. when you signed up you weren't expecting to spend half your day with me but no worries um, no worries this is um so it's it's kind of funny you know talking about ronnie and, and what he's been doing and i you know as you were saying i i forgot the term you said it was the irsc is that what it's called isrc yeah isrc okay um so I had recently learned about that and how, because I, for the longest time, have been kind of a staunch not supporter of these long six, seven month rollouts of records. And by the time you're getting an album, you got like two, three Most songs. And chances are those are the songs, if we're being honest, probably you were like, you, you clearly didn't feel good enough about to push them as singles because they didn't make it as a, as a fourth or fifth or sixth single on an album. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, so speak to that of however you will, but. It's a thing to me where when I learned that those numbers then get aggregated into the the full final version, I was like, yeah. oh, that makes a lot more sense. 
it's still the music industry doing what the music industry has always done, which is find a way to kind of flub the numbers a little bit, which yeah. before it used to be pairing, you know, album sales with concert tickets. And obviously you can't do that anymore because Prince yeah. had a number one world record and no one bought it. And everyone's like, how the fuck did he, I didn't even know he had a new record. How is it? Number one. I haven't heard it. And then it's like, Oh, that world tour he just announced that was a ticket or a CD given away for every ticket sold. So that's how that uh, used to be played uh, back yep, in the day of learning of like Vic victory records and stuff like that you know back in the days and age of the re-release of a cd obviously was a cash grab but when you would put in the dvd or an extra cd in that package that technically counted for two sales even though it was one single unit it counted as a double purchase so when you right. look back at like victory and solid state and like all the like metalcore brands labels repackaging cds a month or two after they came out for a deluxe edition with this extra disc and all this other shit they were just padding those numbers. Um, right. So the industry has always found a way to pad numbers in some way, shape or form. Um, yeah. the, 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 it's just a moving target now. So like once I learned that this is why and how this works, it's like, oh, it's still operating under the same umbrella it always has. We just changed how we're doing it, essentially. Yeah. And I mean, um, honestly, honestly, it, it's a little more honest this way, I think. Oh, you know 100%. Because I mean? it's, like, yeah. it's like if you, you know, if you pay twenty dollars for a you know a dvd or whatever and they just throw in a cd and they're like well now you bought a cd too like you know i mean obviously if i was somebody benefiting from that i'd be like no don't change that i like the money right but like <laughs> um uh but but you know like like that's that's not the most honest way to report your numbers you know um and, right you know but like it's all it's all for the bottom line and whatever so it's not like i don't get it but yeah it's kind of shifty um but like at least this is like you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, the the same so it's, it's the same songs. We put it out a little bit ago. It should those streams should fucking carry over because we worked hard to get right. these fucking streams. You know what I mean? Right. The other thing, too, though, you know, you're talking about falling in reverse and what they've done, like love them or hate them. Uh, I you can't knock what they've done. And honestly, I've been more surprised that maybe it's that more people are trying to do it and they're not being authentic in how they present it. And that's why it's not no one else is really able to have the same level of success i'm really hoping knock on wood i don't know if this is going to happen um it may or may not but um between having cc now uh from black veil on that tour and then my friend andrew from dance gavin i know i have kind of put it in their ear it's like i'm not gonna punish ronnie I don't know if he fucking hangs out sure. with people. I don't know what his he's like at a show. So I don't know what his day to day routine is. I don't know if he just fucks off and then when he comes out for the show, that's it. I imagine. I, I mean, I, I I have no data to back this yeah. up. I imagine. I imagine he's fairly isolated. I, I usually, yeah. I've come. I've come to. I've come to discover that like the front men at that level tend to just kind of stay on their bus. For most of the day, yeah. both for both for like personal health reasons and and like maintaining their voice and stuff, but also like to not get fucking mobbed and punished all the time. So, yeah. so I'm hoping that because he literally handpicked everyone that he tours with himself um, mm -hmm. and for the reasons that I know he picked DGD, uh, which Andrew sort of talked about on here, um, that I'm hoping that I might get to like bend his ear for a couple minutes and just kind of off record maybe be like i really think what i see from behind the scenes i think is really interesting i don't really i haven't really seen you talk much about this is the like kind of like how i prose to you throughout this like is why you're doing x y and z is this why it's why you're doing it was this sort of a long play and you knew that this was going to be a way to make the numbers make sense where you're sort of preaching and proof of concepting Albums don't matter anymore. Singles matter. Singles keep you in the world of everyone mm -hmm. right now, keeps you on Octane, keeps you on all these things, keeps driving people to whatever. However, because you put 90% of this shit onto a record years later, are you also proving that you can have success and that there will be people who are still interested in the product once you put it out all these years later in a collection of da-da-da? So you are still proving that people do actually still want full albums you're kind of yeah. reverse engineering the album as, of sorts. Yeah, I think, and honestly, Rick has kind of been doing that for the last probably 10 years, I would say personally. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I definitely think there's, there's probably some validity to that. Of course, I'm not connected to that camp in any way. So like, it, this is pure speculation. Um, and well, I, you are I, through I, Adam splitter technically. I, 
so, so very very vaguely um uh but uh like i because okay and just like because i hate i hate seeing stuff on like reddit of like well this is how it works and i and i'm sure i'm sure that this what that this is what happened and i'm like shut the fuck up like you have no idea um 15 uh, percenter yeah <laughs> right um but uh but i don't i what you're saying does not sound um uh outlandish by any stretch of the imagination and if i it, the the speculation that i would provide which means nothing um is if there was any discussion about whether or not cuz most of the stuff on their new record um is recent enough right it's come out within the Ish. last year or yeah. two yeah yeah um the bulk of it the, the 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 title track is the main thing that's that's really old but yeah so if it, so the, i'm i'm I won't say I'm sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a conversation with the label or just internally. Oh, maybe adding like, it on to help boost the numbers. Well, well, of of saying, well, you know, yeah, it could boost the numbers, but should it go on there? It's old or whatever. But what I would argue, like it, like if I were in his position outside of like how many streams it got and how how big of a song it is and whatever, what I would argue is that's where the the current direction for this band started. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, like, if you look at if you look at what I see an album as, an album is defining, and I kind of kind of mentioned it earlier when I'm going back and forth on whether or not to do uh, to put this all as one record for Hillhaven. Um, an album is an era. It's defining an era of that band or that artist, that project. Um, and I don't think anyone would argue that this era of Falling in Reverse started with Popular Monster. You know, Absolutely. some people could some people could argue drugs because there was a little bit of that on there, but popular monster was the one. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's where it was just like, oh, the king has arrived, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so like if you're talking about like if you just want to speak strictly artistically, and and the argument is no, it's about defining the era of this band. Well, that song started the era of this band. So I I I would 100 percent argue in favor for several reasons of having that of having the, the song on on that record and um but also you you know what you're saying about the singles i think is also important because they can just keep touring and you know getting bigger and keep putting out these songs that blow up and you know have these crazy you know um like mcu style fucking like dune level music videos which is insane yeah. it's so sick um uh just be able to do whatever the fuck they want you know, or for whatever, what he wants, you know what I mean? We say, we say, we say they, cause it's seen as a band, but everybody knows it's Ronnie, you know? So, yeah. <clears throat> um, like, uh, I, I, I think most of, most of like what you're sort of expecting or, or imagining might be the case. I, I, I would be, I would be surprised if like none of that ever came up in conversation <laughs> while, it was, while it was materializing, you know? yeah yeah i don't know he, he's just an interesting person and i feel like if through the friendships i made doing the show and just you know kind of doing this it's funny side tangent i always when a show like an episode goes this long or whatever and like you know we meander between bullshit to then like why i think everyone actually wants to listen to this um i hear the one person that's like commented on one of my videos a long time ago uh with mike from stained and he was like i don't understand how you I should frame this actually put it in my office somewhere um but it was like i don't know how you keep getting these big guests you suck no one listens to you <laughs> it's just like maybe it's because people actually like me <laughs> and like talking to me um yeah maybe i don't know um but you're, it was just a thing i remember like all, just for 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 anyone listening who might have a, 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 a an opinion uh like that i have not met john before like we have like, technically in passing, well well at in times. in gary yeah indiana or illinois well, or where in a few are. other few other places yeah we have because i saw yeah. you here in grand rapids because uh okay. Okay. the so it, it was a, it was tour... all during like my time with ink ice yep okay. usually me right. hanging out with patrick is when i would see you in passing okay. you and ricky oh um, so okay so it might have just been like what's up dude you know what i mean like yeah, yeah. Just, or okay. like patrick would be like hey this is my friend da, da, da. and you're like oh okay <laughs> got it okay all years right. later so... you're in for four hours and talk to him <laughs> right right so yeah so like but point point being like i like apart from maybe saying hello like 
I've not yeah. met like it's as it like I, I wasn't it wasn't like, oh, yeah, let's go talk to John. That guy rules. You know what I mean? But I've been here for four yeah. and a half hours. You know what I mean? So, yeah. like, I think that says something <laughs> it's like pretty. Personal, yeah, no. Dude. Um, but it, it's a thing where, you know, I'm, I'm hoping maybe to like get to pick his brain a little bit and, and maybe he'd be receptive to that. I'm also expecting that not to fucking happen. But in my head, at least if I do, I'd like to kind of come at it with like something to say ahead of time instead of being like, oh, I uh you know uh and then sure. you're like no like i have i i don't know if like, you got a couple of minutes strikes, i have a few he questions strikes me as a man who values his time yes so to me i feel like if if especially given the fact that two of the people that are bringing me into their world haven't been on the show and you know he handpicked them then potentially he might be like okay i handpicked them i've gotten to know them they seem on the level and if they're vouching for you then i'll give you this one like a couple minutes um, sure, cause th yeah. that's also how that shit works where it's like, I, you got one shot in a few minutes and you're the people yeah. who put up for you either put you there. And if you don't get it, then that's it. And that's the opportunity is wasted. But, um, yeah. the other thing too, and I was just reminded of this cause I, again, Facebook memory, cause I always look for those from my uh, old photos of my dog, uh, half the time. And it was the thing where I was reminded today, like I went to, I guess today is when we went to go see, uh, Kanye in Chicago, do the Donda event. Um, wife and I are big Kanye West music fans. Um, famously, I, I was kind of trying to make that point with Doc uh, when he was on, and I put my foot in my mouth with a lot of the shit that he says and does personally. And I was like, dude, I, I don't pay much attention to him really uh, in a personal I was setting. Say, I, did, but... I, did, I did enjoy that you put the emphasis on music. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. Well, that's why I had to start doing that because I also am a firm believer that I can separate somebody from their art. And I understand sure. there's sort of a duality to that because the the person had to go through something that inspired the art, but um, I can separate a person from, from their art a lot of times. And I know some people just aren't able to do that. Um, a big but it was a thing where fan and as long love Michael Jackson as, and, and as long as Annie from smooth criminal was not underage, I'm okay with liking that song. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, but it's a thing where, I'm surprised this hasn't happened and I just don't understand if it's too radical of an idea and, and sort of in some instances him doing this, it has failed from a commercial standpoint, not from the live ticket selling aspect, which I think would overshadow album sales. But I was going to say like what he did with Donda and I guess even to a degree going back to like uh, life of Pablo where he's taking an unfinished album and he's taking it out and essentially doing listening parties, but really with the Donda events uh, where he's doing a performance of sorts in front of an arena full of people or a stadium full of people listening to an album that they've never heard. And you're able to sell out these things. And then, cause I went to the last one in Chicago, there were two others in Atlanta and it was interesting because I speaking to the event that I saw, you know, when you're hearing uh, jail, and now that we know that Donda has been out, we know there's two different iterations of jail, one with Jay-Z and him, and then one with uh, him, Manson, singing the, the hook, and uh, the baby, I think, is who the other person was on it. Um, but it's interesting, because when that's happening, and Manson literally comes out, and he's not performing, he's just standing there as the album's playing, and we're all like, yo, where's Jay's verse? Jay's not on this. Who is this? Oh, shit, that's the baby. Who's this other person? And then I'm like, it's probably Manson, and that's why he's here. Um, and you're just kind of like taking in this spectacle of like the best way I could describe it. And it's funny you say uh, Jackson. It reminds me sort of what Moonwalker was as an out as a video. It was a, a digital move. It was a movie comprised of small vignettes, videos of all the songs on off mm -hmm. of uh, off of bad. And when you kind of look at it that way, it's crazy that like we've not really seen something done that way where the, the album essentially is sort of a narrative. The music is the narrative that ties together the whole thread of this this movie. Um, and to see something like Kanye going through and, and taking and release or showcasing albums that aren't done that are still kind of being worked on, presenting them in, in a entertaining way of like this is a spectacle. It's, it's almost like theater essentially like a performance to what you're hearing that I'm surprised bigger artists like a Beyonce. And I really have to stay, feel like I have to stay in rock or not rock uh, pop or hip hop because I think they're at the level where they can consistently go to those kind of spaces and fill them out. 
And I think the fan base is a little more understanding of what we're hearing is just, it is what it is. And like, we get to be this part of the, the live experience of this isn't the final version we're hearing, but we want to be involved in the process of what this becomes with these artists that we've grown to love so much that I'm kind of surprised we don't see it so much in anything else that no one else has really taken that big stab at it. And I feel like the closest it can come in rock and metal sort of would almost be like, and you can't really do this anymore because of, of the internet and people having phones on them, but it almost be essentially like, playing the songs out live when they're not done. You're like, Hey, we're, we're I'm still kind of figuring out my lyrics to this. Da, 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 da. But the cool thing is, is you might hear the song. And then when it's finally released, you're like, Oh shit. The second verse became the chorus. Like they realized that yeah. that was the, the part. And like, you're able to kind of shop and see in real time, like, Oh, this part's hitting this part's not. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's well, fix kind that. Of, and kind of the make the whole thing. things. Right, um, exactly. I was going to say, you know, that, being, but... yeah, being a, conf- a professional comedian is just going around and like basically just writing your album in front of people, right? Um, right. <clears throat> which sounds yeah. terrifying. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but honestly, honestly, I think like, like everything that you're talking about sounds cool. I think the, the, the reason that we don't see it um, is because it's too risky. I think that's just what mm-hmm. it comes down to. Um, I think that there's probably very few artists that could pull that off and like pull it off well in their fan and their fan base at large would be very receptive to it and not be getting comments and, and like reviews of the concert of like, I want my fucking money back. He didn't play any of the songs that I wanted to hear. Um, I don't know what any right. of this was. He just stood there. And then like some famous people came out and also just stood there. Um, I don't mean to be reductionist of it in that way. I'm just saying like, like the, ge- I feel like the general he did light himself on fire for what it's worth. Oh, the there end. you go. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was cool. So, but I I think that the, and maybe I'm not giving the audience enough credit, but I think obviously music very much like there was a time when it was all just getting figured out. Right. And then there was hmm. a time where it was being sort of corporatized and, um, but there was still things being figured out. It's all been figured out now. So everyone knows the formulas that work. And there are still people that push the boundaries. And I think that's important. And obviously, um, like, you know, generational artists come along and just fucking flip the script on everything. And that rules. And I think that needs to continue to happen. Right. Um, I just think that that's a risky thing to do. Right. Because you could flip the book and now everything's upside down and nobody likes the fucking book. Right. So, um, uh, so I think the reason, and also I think that in certain cases, like if we're talking, you know, you're talking about like pop and hip hop. Um, if you talk about like somebody like a Beyonce, now I'm not here to say that Beyonce is not an artist. She obviously is right. But she's also many other things. She's also focused mm-hmm. on a lot of other things. And there's also a difference in people. I mean, Michael Jackson is another example of this. Obviously he was an artist, but I think first and foremost, people would consider him a performer, right? He's yes. known He's known for what he does live. He's known for bringing that experience. He's he's known like the 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 music the music hooks you in, and then you see the show, and you're like fuck, right? Like you're you're a fan for life at that point because he's just that fucking good, or was just that fucking good, right? <clears throat> um, there's a difference between being an artist and being a performer, and um, and uh, or you can be both, but you can put bigger emphasis on one than the other. So there might be there are artists clearly like, you know, Kanye in this instance, who are fully ready and willing to risk everything because they have the platform and they know that they're not their, their career is not going to fucking go under because of this. And they're willing to go out and potentially lose their ass on a fucking tour and just do this effectively like performance art thing you know, but they're not actually performing. Like they're just showing you the songs. And that's like, oh, that's like this really weird, you know, it's not what people think of when they go to see a concert. And so when you're like, oh, I saw Kanye kind of, you know, like um, it's a, uh, it's a weird thing objectively, whether it's yeah. cool or whether it worked or not, it's a weird thing, right. For, for the way that the music industry operates. And so I think that the reason we don't see that is because it's just too risky and, and not, um, and it's too, it's too artsy. It's too artsy mm. um, to be to be mainstream, um, at least right now, I think. And uh, because, um, you know, there's like uh, you could be, you know, the person at the it, it, you know, the person whose one painting is being shown at the art gallery 
and hopefully someone comes in and it speaks to them and they pay you a hundred thousand dollars to buy that painting right? right or or you could be the person whose fucking artwork is in every window at mcdonald's and that's what the music industry at large is going for <laughs> right they want they, they want it in front of as many eyes as humanly possible and that doesn't mean that the artist who fucking their artist hanging at mcdonald's worked any less hard necessarily on whatever that piece is whether it's a photo or an advertisement or an actual piece of you know drawn or painted art or something like that um than the person in the art gallery but it's more mass produced it's more consumable it's more marketable right and so that's like when you talk about bigger artists the bigger artists inevitably means bigger money inevitably means more people involved inevitably means more conversations about how do we keep a healthy bottom line all the time Right. And so so uh, doing like like I, I think it's always going to be the exception as opposed to the rule where artists do things like that. Um, doing yeah. concept records, I still think is cool. Uh, you know, a lot of metal bands still do that. Eminem's new record is a concept record and I fucking love it so much. Um, but uh, that was a stressful week at work. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do we do we do stuff for mom spaghetti slash m m okay and so y'all had the, a like one. we 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 had a production run we had to have it sampled first of all uh we had to sample i think four or five different designs and then they needed to be done approved and we had to get out orders of i think everything was at least a 600 piece order uh of most of those designs by that friday like had to be in detroit by that friday so That's, that was yeah. a real bitch. And then That's we got a design that some other company did of the of the image of him in the body bag. And the version that someone else made was a DTG. And they want us to make it better because they weren't happy with how it came out. And it's like, we're not going to match some of these tones that you like because it was done with a fucking printer versus like each individual right, ink right, right. put in through the screens. So it's yeah. that was what I left right before I had surgery. We were doing a few more runs for for uh eminem so that was everyone's like i'm so excited for this record i was like eminem could fuck right off right now <laughs> <laughs> right yeah when you're on the manufacturing side of things it's definitely a lot more stressful but yeah so i think i mean i i definitely like concept records and i think like you know it's it's definitely cool when you know that an artist is really connected to their stuff and i don't think that's ever really going to go away nor should it um no. but i just i i do think that like there are probably very few artists outside of somebody you know kind of weird and like mainstream but also fringe like kanye like he's a he, he kind of exists in this weird uh limbo um right where like he could market that and his fans are like fuck yeah i'm going you know what i mean yeah it's like i mean i'll tell i'll tell you right now like i think probably most bands that i enjoy like even the more formative ones like lamb of god it, like it probably by the numbers is probably still my favorite band i don't listen to them as much as i used to um but uh if lamb of god announced a tour and they were like we're not playing anything we're just gonna stand there and we're gonna put we're gonna show you the new record that we're working on i would not go <laughs> like i would i, I guess, wouldn't buy it i guess that i did a bad job i was trying to very quickly describe sure the I, thing. I i understand um, i'm sure there was yeah. more to it than that but if it was oh yeah if it was basically more. like if it was if it was if it was like hey there's like a there's like an intimate kind of listening party thing i'd be like mm. i'll go to that that sounds cool but right. it's like hey buy tickets yeah. to this arena show where we're going to show you the albums not that's not done like I'm I might not be like that stupid, but I'd be like, I'll probably wait until they tour it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's also because I, yeah, play I shows mean, for work, though. So it takes it takes a right. lot to get me into it, into a fucking venue these days. Yeah, I uh, I'll leave you with this. I don't know how much of a reader you are. I'm not. So you might miss okay. this on me. <laughs> OK, I will say it's it's by my standards. It's not a, a very hefty book i think it's like a i think it's about maybe 200 pages tops um it might the number sticking out in my head is like 167 for some reason so um it might even be under under that essentially there was a book uh put out i don't remember how long ago it came out um i actually bought it and my goal was to and i should text jordan when i'm done with this um my goal was to because i've talked about this book on on the podcast quite a bit I bought the book and my goal was to every person I've kind of mentioned it to be like, okay. So like I gave it to Jordan Buckley. Um, Cause I was like, Hey, I think you would really get something out of this book um, based on a few things we've talked about. 
And so I gave it to him when he was last here. My goal was, okay, Jordan's done with it. Send it back to me. And then I'm going to send it to like the next person I talk to this. And I'm just, it's going to kind of be like essentially like a traveling book that I'm going to give to everyone to like read and just kind of get this experience of, you know, what I thought was interesting about it. And then we can talk about it. Um, in short, the, the, you know, elevator pitches, uh, when Wu-Tang Clan was, they had a guy that was like bugging them to, to work with them, to mainly RZA. And so this guy worked his way through the ranks of, you know, the industry and finally got to RZA through family and all this kind of other stuff. And he's like, man, you should put out, you know, a, an album that sounds kind of like, you know, 36 chambers and all this kind of stuff. And RZA was like, I can't, I'm not that person anymore. I can't make that album. I already made that album. I can't go back and make it. I'm not that same right. guy anymore. But you are kind of newer into your career production and da 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 da, and you have studied it. You might be able to get as close to it as possible because it's still a part of your DNA, like inherently. Mm -hmm. I'll work with you to kind of help make it and kind of oversee it. And so that's what essentially ended up becoming the album that they sold for a million dollars. But this guy and RZA were having conversations about, you know, can we sell an album for? you know, a lot of money. And what is it about art that you can make, you can sell a painting for, you know, $60 million, but an album, which takes just as much life experience and all these kind of things to go through to, to uh, formulate and get out of you is looked at as, you know, worthless essentially. Yeah. Come on, and you know. kind of, yeah. And how they kind of boiled it down was the thing that makes these things more valuable than others is at least in the, the sake of fine art it's a one of one yes there are recreations but this is the one of one there's no others that exist and so that was why they tried tackling this album from that perspective of if we only make one and make it available to the highest bidder essentially does that showcase that music as art is equally as valuable intrinsically as a painting because it's a one of one we've now reduced it to the same measurements that makes these things more valuable and so they I actually like talks, that. yeah and in the book they talk about some of the the problems of getting some of the other wu-tang guys on involved because it's not going through typical distribution the the payouts and such weren't going to be the same way up front and a lot of those kind of things as well as like obviously your royalties and publishing don't matter at that point when it's a one of one because you're selling yeah. it the one time and that's all the money you're getting so yeah. they kind of broke down a lot of interesting talking points along the process of making this album and then subsequently to kind of proof a concept and to showcase that there really was music they were working on and not just all right asshole here's a fucking blank disc and we just you know robbed right, you right uh also which would prove a point as well but the quote unquote leaked uh three songs that weren't going to be on the album and they gave them different tiers and they didn't assign them the monetary value based on anything it wasn't like well we think these two are worth this and the other ones are worth more it wasn't anything like that they just picked a couple of random songs that they were working on and then like assigned two of them at five dollars uh some at 50 and then, uh, another one or two at a hundred dollars and they were like what was interesting was the five dollar ones got leaked almost immediately um i think they I could be misremembering this part, but I think they said both the 50 and the hundred dollar songs never got leaked even as of the writing uh, of the book. And they were talking about how that showed perception of value that if you spend $5 on something, you're more willing to just give it away. Yeah, like, who cares? Five bucks. Everybody can have it. Yeah. But when you start assigning certain monetary values, it gets interesting to see how the perception of what it's worth to you now changes. And so to me, the, the conversation of commodifying art and then how do you stand to change the perception of, of your art, art in general and art to yourself and the populace at large? How, how do you do that? How, does, how do you start all of this? And then subsequently, like when the album came out and all the, the, the bullshit surrounding uh, Martin Scarelli, the farmer guy who obviously- I was going like, to say, that's the one he uh, bought, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of talking about like how the album sort of uh, post it being bought out by that guy and all the problems that he had kind of right around the same time sort of kind of tainted the release a little bit or the, the like the impact of the, the one album. Um, I hear now someone else is potentially going to buy it and they're going to maybe distribute it. But it essentially now all these years later of that book coming out, because I only found it like two years ago. Um, I realized it almost was the the birth, the proto NFT, because essentially you're 
there's no distribution for this. The only you have it, and it doesn't really exist beyond, I guess, a, a physical version of it, which is different from an NFT. But what was interesting was like how you know NFTs started even getting into movies. Like Kevin Smith, I think, technically sold a movie that was an NFT. The movie existed in it, and then there were certain concessions made legally of uh, whoever bought it that like you can't, you can eventually distribute it, put it out, do whatever you want to it. But it has to be within X amount of time, almost like sunset clauses and a lot of the different clauses in, in recording right, contracts right. of we can do this with this up until this point. Then it goes to all rights revert back to you or whatever. So but it was just really interesting to kind of read that. So to me, people who are kind of steeped in this industry uh, and make art at, for, a, for a living, for a commodity, essentially, um, I think the book is interesting because of where does it take your mind? What does it make you think of? How does it maybe make you flip your mind on 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 your own art or others art like you know because you're there was a great analogy of like you know there's some art and it's worth millions of dollars and it sits in the louvre or there's a guy who made art and it sits in fucking every mcdonald's yeah does what like it's, it's and it's like nothing nothing to be taken away from either person because they made art and someone found value in it and put it somewhere but the location maybe isn't as prestigious because that guy's art is in every fucking McDonald's across the world. So technically more people are seeing it. However, this one guy who is in a, in a very prestigious museum, his art is deemed more valuable Yeah, by right. the sheer sake of it being a one of one and, and where it's located versus you could look, flip the coin and go, well, this dude's arts in 16 million McDonald's across the world actually isn't his art more valuable and more like having, to use a Spotify term and DSP term, isn't his impression and his reach exponentially more, more valuable in that sense than the one sitting in one place that yeah. not I, everyone I mean, can I, get to. I also, I also think that like, there's, there's, if you're, if you're kind of deciding which one you'd rather be, or like which one you would, you sure. would aspire to be like, um, I also think like you're, it could be wrong, but in general, you're probably younger if you're or like more dug in if you're like no i'm gonna be the guy at the louvre and the reason that no. i say that <laughs> the reason that i say that is because so like ever i think every professional musician's path started the same i play this instrument or i'm i'm good at this i like doing this i'm fucking in love with this i'm going to start a band i'm going to start a musical project it's going to get signed i'm going to get big and that's going to be how i make my living that's my that's the dream right <clears throat> and then depending on your life maybe exactly that happens or maybe it takes a different turn or maybe you don't wind up in music at all right but obviously i'm talking about professional musicians here so like in my case right i found out i was really good at learning songs and that wound up being my job right i learn songs that other people have already written and i get paid to play them every night um when you when you've been in the business for a long time it can take your creative love away for a little bit and it did for me for a while i had to kind of find it again that's part of mm. what Hill Haven. That's part of what Hill Haven was. Was me sort of like finding my creativity why? again. Um, yeah, it was just like I had something to write about now. You know what I mean? Like I went through a bunch of shit in 2022, and like now it was like I'd, I'd never written lyrics before, and it's like all right, now I have shit I can write lyrics about. You know, um, mm. <clears throat> um, but even with releasing Hill Haven, like I'm I'm not sitting here like this is the single greatest artistic venture you know that i've endeavored on you know whatever like right like i re i recognize that i'm making like commercial rock music but that was part of the aim right that was like how do so I far away from what you normally do yeah yeah it is and i mean usually I'm, I'm making fucking obscure progressive death metal you know what i mean like that's that's what that's what my creativity has been for years you know so right um um and I love it, but it's like, this is just a much different thing. And so, so the goal wasn't just like, oh, let me, let me just make this, this one thing that might be really valuable to me and maybe one or two other people or whatever. It was like, no, like, how do I, how do I, how do I launch a project that like is meaningful to me and does, does scratch this creative itch and does make me feel fulfilled and all that kind of stuff. But like, feel like I'm doing it for a, greater purpose other than to just like record something 
you know, and right. to try to, to like, and, and, you know, I've never commercial, I, I've worked for a bunch of people that have successfully commercialized things. I've never done that. How do I do that? It was like a new challenge. You know what I mean? And I'm still working on it. Like by no means am I like, I am now the picture of success. Right. Um, uh, Doc Coyle. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yes. Me, Doc Coyle. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I just think that, um, like, like you said, like it's not you don't it's not really taking anything away from either artist or whatever, but the location might be more prestigious or or prestigious, whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know, in the case of a painter or something like that, that's that's definitely very you know, cur like that's very valid and very you know, like uh, it's a correct analysis of like where you know if you're a painter, where your art can end up. Is it going to be in a dentist office or in a Starbucks or is it going to be at the fucking Louvre? The other thing, though, to keep in mind, like, do you want to be like, OK, 80 years from now, somebody could be digging through the rubble of civilization <laughs> and somehow find my stupid death metal band's last record and be like, this is unlike anything I could have ever imagined and like, like, is now a generation defining fucking insane shit is that going to happen probably not but it technically could there are physical albums out there um uh would would you rather have that because that's what most of the guys in the louvre are right right yeah they're people who died fucking destitute and miserable and hungry and uh, missing an ear <laughs> And, you know, like, and, and everyone thought they were fucking morons and now they're legends. And look like, at me I'm now, not, you dicks. I'm, <laughs> right. And look, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that's not important. Right. Like that's, that's right. Like that's an insane legacy. Right. Like I, like I could only ever hope to leave the impact that Van Gogh left on his medium. Right. But that didn't help him at all. While he was alive, no. he wasn't impacting no. jack shit while he was alive. Nope. Except for the nope. fucking like part, the trauma part of the brain of the lady whose ear, who he gave his ear to, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like so, uh, th like it, it just depends on what your goal is. You know what I mean? Like, do you want to make just completely timeless fucking art? Like, is and that's the only thing that matters. Like, it's not, it's not a bonus. It's like, it's like that. Like I'm going to be like the defining, blah, 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 blah. like, or is it, just, or is it just like, I really like doing this, and I'd rather this be my living than something else. I'd rather hang right. my art, and I'd rather hang my art in McDonald's than work at McDonald's. Right. I'll leave you with this, and then I'll have you plug whatever uh, for socials and so forth that you want to plug. So, a friend of mine, uh, one of my co-hosts on the other podcast, is a tattoo artist, and obviously very big into art as a whole. I. And I'll say that he said this and I haven't taken the time to really research this to see if there's any validity to it. So grain of salt with this. However, I would also say I don't think I'm going to find anything that really proves this, but it does just because of kind of my knowledge of this space of, of a art medium, I would be inclined to believe this. He was kind of saying that a lot of the art that we take in as far as art like that, like, you know, fine art, modern art, whatever, that a lot of them aren't picked because they like it's moving and everyone's like, Oh my God, the, the, the way this person's using this or the, the brush strokes and all these kind of things or the way he's using color, you know, they'll say that like kind of after the fact, but a lot of it's just randomly picked. Like they're just like, Oh, what about this guy? Yeah. And part of me is like, I kind of fucking believe that because why is it? And this is a really stupid frame of reference, but why is it that we can then go like, look back on these things and it's also why i have a problem with art critique as a whole why is it that we can look back on on those arts because i know when he was going to a, an art co college here you know they would have to they'd study like van gogh or like a, a rembrandt or something and yeah. they're talking about how they broke all the traditional rules of art at the time when they made these different paintings look at the brushstrokes this isn't how people were doing this this, this use of color wasn't what we were doing back then but the weird thing is, is when you then are given the project, paint something or create something inspired by these people. And then the, you know, the 
lesson, you know, the artist that, that's teaching these classes, the teacher, there's the word I was looking for, um, essentially will tell you that it's not like this person because of X, Y, or Z. And to me, the part that's always been fucking weird about that is you're lauding the these people for supposed fucking to break the rules. Exactly. And the thing is that has always fascinated me with art in any different type of capacity, but I, I really can pinpoint it in fine art is why is it that we laud these people for taking these chances and doing something that wasn't conventional at the time and, and maybe in real time in their time, they weren't, they didn't get any of that praise in real time. It took a generation or two or three to find these things and go, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And and look at how it inspired somebody else to then take it and go here and, and where we've gone with art because of this. But when you tell someone, okay, now take that same inspiration, those same ideas and do something. And then you get downgraded because you're not following the quote unquote rules. And it's like the whole point of all of these greats is they didn't follow the rules. And I'm not following any typical rules either i might be using you know this light source or these colors or or this whatever as a, a groundwork but literally everything else is it is following the rules because it's breaking all the rules right so like it, it's always kind of really fascinated me that people are in a position to teach and then want you to be inspired to create something inspired by this thing and then tear it apart for all the things that it is not and it's like, that's so ass backwards to me. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. All I'm going to say, and this is not really in the same vein, but this is the last thing that I'll say, because we've now hit the five hour mark. I know you are I, the second I longest even, podcast I've ever done. Holy shit. Okay. And like, dude, there's no way anyone's going to be like, Chris Kelly, that's a name I'm going to listen to for five hours. Um, I'm going to probably break this up into the two hours of quote unquote bullshit. And then the other go. two hours of like music, and then you'll have a, a whole I week. Think it's, I think of, that's uh, a good idea. Um, yeah, I don't usually because you were like you're gonna edit, and I'm like I'm just editing out where you and I both got up to pee, and then that's it. And then <laughs> okay. from there, there's no editing happening. And it, I and then once I kind of thought of that, I was like, well, I guess I already have to make one edit because I don't I don't like editing because that's not how this really happened. Sure. Um, but I think because I I did notice a, a direct change naturally, even that it's like. I don't think if you listen to it as a whole, you're like, oh my god, that that didn't segue at all. Like everything kind of has gone. Yeah, no, it all came pretty well. It all came each other. Yeah. But I think for the sake of someone seeing a five hour podcast, you're like, I'm not listening to that this week. I have other shows I'd rather <laughs> listen to. So I right, think what right. I'm going to do is my shows always come out on Sundays, so I'll probably drop the first half, and then I'll be like, and then on Wednesday you get the other half of the conversation that's more centralized on on this talking point. Sure. Okay. Word. Um, but yeah. So what I will say. For me. What I will say yeah. is that if a random guy can stick a brush in a bucket and fling it onto a canvas and sell it for millions of dollars because some trust fund fuck was like, it speaks to me, then I too was flung at a wall. <laughs> then, then you suffer, but why by napalm death should be a multi-million dollar fucking one of one track because the exact same noise was made ah! and that was it all right <laughs> so it's it should be just as valuable um i'm 100 on par with everything that you're saying though about um about like you know you can't say create something that's inspired by a rule breaker and then <laughs> and then the follow all the rules it. right follow all the rules that this guy that, that this guy created by breaking the other ones yeah fuck you it's funny. It's funny you say the the song. Oh, maybe. Ah, shit. Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong wrong song. No, you suffer is literally like a. It's like a one or two second song. No, I I was gonna say I I would I would go a different route. Equally as like polarizing and out there, I would have chosen. And I thought the song was called "Gay Fags" by Anal Cunt, but I guess maybe the song is called "All Our Fans Are Gay." The one that's I just like. The gayest man alive. He's so gay. What a fag. Like <laughs> I always it's, it's association, and again, going back to the East Coast thing of CKY, and they just had a guy wearing that they just were filming from a bus walking by, and then they were like someone had grabbed like the overhead PA on the bus and were making fun of the dude. And then that was a song playing in the background, and you're just like, that's so funny and so stupid. <laughs> like, that's why awesome. is this funny? But Angel Gun as a whole, I think, is a very funny and weird band uh in that yeah, space. For sure. How can you not? I don't know. I, I think like as a whole, like people who get like not to uh, 
quote unquote dumb down your you know like your 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 genre of choice that you chose to start into and so forth but it's like to me i always feel like that like the super extreme versions of like metal i've always felt like it's like they take themselves way too seriously and half the time i'm just like it's it's not that serious no that's like it took me doing my friend show doing uh because like i'm not super my biggest complaint against and i literally said this to uh Oh, fuck, I forget the guy's name. Uh, the drummer from Dying Fetus. Um, I had him on, and it was when Wrong One to Fuck With came out. Um, or not Wrong One to Fuck With. Oh, it was the balloons the- are back. What, what the, the fuck? <laughs> what happened? What did, you, what did I do? What did you do? I don't know. Um, maybe it was the wrong one to fuck with. Uh, it was whatever. Uh, yeah, whatever. It was a Dying Fetus record, and it sounded really good. The production on it was really good, and that's why I was like... Finally, a death metal fucking band that like understands that like some good production is not an awful thing. Like you don't have to record it on a boombox in the middle of your fucking room in a basement. That's all like I hate, you know I hate brick that. and concrete. I hate, I hate fucking raw shitty production. I can't stand it. Yeah, worst. but I feel like between that and punk, like uh, another podcaster and I go on this all the time because he's like, I don't understand why you don't like punk. I don't understand why you don't like you know these things. And I'm like, the production on it's just so awful. Like I just can't because like, it sounds like shit. Next question. And then he was like, I don't know why you're so hung up on production. I'm like, I grew up in the 80s, dude. Even my metal was like, had a sheen to it. Like, everything was pop in the 80s. I was like, that's why. Like, you can sound better. Do it. (laughs) Right. Yeah. For sure. Speaking of, uh, I'll leave you with this last last horrible joke. I was just thinking to myself, Galder left uh, Demi Borgir. You should go join them because you're bald too. I, I would take the gig for sure. I can't speak. And then, and then you could but, be, you right. could be Galder. Well, he doesn't speak. I don't think, I don't think he sings or speaks and they, and they sing in English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where? End of episode. End of episode. I win. You don't want to plug anything. That's it. You just want to end it there. You don't want to plug anything everyone where go, people can find go you. Fucking, if you. If you've made it this far, everyone, it would mean the world to me. And comment on Chris's comment on Chris's recent post on Instagram that you made it. Uh, let's just yeah, see if that's right. a thing i always wanted to do that i just want to see there, that yeah hashtag you made it yeah um but yeah, yeah there you uh, go hill haven official on instagram it's hill haven band on tiktok i won't explain why we had to do different ones because it's stupid um <clears throat> heaven hill uh it's uh Insta- instagram is really kind of the only platform that we're like really plugging like we're posting stuff on tiktok but i don't understand that platform so um I don't <clears throat> and uh hill haven on spotify uh sycophants is the song that's out right now everyone please 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 go listen or if you're listening on octane please tell them that you want to hear it all the time um because that will, that will that will con- that will um convert to success and dollars and cents for us um so yeah that's uh that's all i got all right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and looking forward to hopefully more than a show a year and maybe one coming out here or at the very least, if your touring schedule permits that you make it out this way, try to do one. And yeah, I won't punish you for like five hours <laughs> for, sure, for sure. All right, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're uh, we're connected now. So um, when I come through, because I will be doing something in North America. So that was my conversation. That is the conclusion of my conversation with Chris Kelly. The epic almost six hours total time uh, talking with Chris. Uh, This was one of those, uh, if I'm being really truthfully honest, um, this was a lifesaver. This this was scheduled not too long after I had done my foot surgery. I was really not sure how busy or productive I was going to be. And it's interesting, you know, I, I've talked about it quite a bit on this show over the last month or so, but like how reverse chronologically everything has been happening. So, you know, I was doing these episodes in some instances leading up to my foot surgery. This was, you know, post my foot surgery. And now here I am and I'm about to go back to work. Uh, I'm recording this on the 7th of October uh, because I, I don't know if I'm going to run into any issues with putting the video versions of these together. So I'm giving myself as much time as possible to, uh, to work through all that. But uh, point being, I'm now basically two days away from going back to work part time and, and starting kind of the reacclimating into my normal life as it had been po- before my surgery. And so it's really interesting to to remember listening to this. And, and I think a lot of the reason 
that this was uh, such a long chat was because I was kind of longing for some semblance of normalcy uh, that was not my day to day of just sitting in a, in bed or laying in bed, I should say, one or the other, playing video games, watching TV, not being able to be weight-bearing. Um, yes, I could use my knee scooter to get around the house, but it was so cumbersome to just do anything that essentially all I wanted to do was nothing uh, because it was just hard. Um, it's crazy to be on the other side of all of that, though. Uh, literally today, like I said, um, I'm going to work in two days. I am kind of finishing up my physical therapy and stuff like that. And, you know, as of last week when I'm recording, we found I'm only 25% behind uh, with my right foot from where my left foot is. Um, so to only be, I think now we are officially a full month removed from my surgery, actually two months removed from my surgery. So the six weeks, uh, non weight bearing. And now I'm about three weeks out of that as I'm recording this. So to only be 25% like less effective or like out of the hundred that my left foot is to only be 25% down, uh, with only being weight bearing for two and a half, three weeks, uh, is pretty crazy to me. Um, but I think also speaks to how much I wanted this. Um, so for me, it's really interesting, like I said, to, to go back to this chat and just remember like feeling so down and feeling so alone. Um, and Chris really gave me like a nice morale boost when I really needed it. And I don't know that he knows that. I think I've texted him that um, afterward, like maybe the next day after we did this chat. But uh, if if you're listening, Chris, uh, man, you really helped me through a uh, really struggle time for me, a struggling, that's not, I don't even know why I'm saying it like that. Uh, but essentially you really helped me out, uh, when I needed there to be somebody. Cause when we did this, it was the middle of the day. I had nobody around. My wife was working and I was just really burnt out. Um, so I really needed this. This really kind of helped me get through probably at least a week, um, of just bullshit that I had to deal with. So, um, that's to say essentially as well, that's, if you're going through some shit, sometimes do something. Um, and sometimes it's just the act of doing something that was normal or is normal to your day to day. And thankfully the podcast existed because if I didn't have the podcast to do while I was down, I, I honestly don't know if how much worse it would have gotten, how much more in the, the hole I was in mentally that I would have been in had I not had this opportunity to, to talk to people and kind of talk about things and work through things. Uh, and just honestly, even if it was only for 40 minutes that one day, it gave me something to look forward to. So, uh, this, this podcast has been insanely invaluable when I really need it, uh, over the years. So, uh, thanks to Chris, thanks to all of you for making it through almost six hours of me bullshitting, uh, with, with the guest. <laughs> Hopefully there was something in this that you really enjoyed. I know I took a lot out of uh, my conversation with Chris, and keep up with Hillhaven. Uh, we're going to start plugging all the things. I did it at the end of last episode, but if you like keep up with Hillhaven, Hillhaven Band on Facebook, Hillhaven Official on Instagram, Hillhaven Band on Twitter. Uh, if you like keep up with Chris, you can find him on Chris Lawrence Kelly on Instagram. Uh, go to chriskpro.com and go to, uh, there's like a link tree as well in the show notes below. Go to that, click on anything, follow the band, keep up with Chris. Uh, it's been really funny watching him uh, post all the videos of him, you know, pushing the new single and so forth for Hill Haven. So very amusing. I was joking about something uh, the other day with him, uh, with one of the ones I was like, I feel like this was, uh, you were on the way downstairs to go <laughs> do laundry and we're like, I guess I could record a video real quick. <laughs> So it's been real fun to see that. But uh, and it's also great knowing, too, that a lot of people don't enjoy making these videos, but it's the necessary evil of what we have to do. Uh, so it's just kind of amusing that it's the thing we do. We tolerate it like a lot of things. Uh, if you would like to keep up with uh, the podcast, like I said, Bruce Beak Pod on all your major social media platforms. Email me at brutallyspeaking at gmail.com with any suggestions for guests. Uh, keep conversation going with anything maybe that you enjoyed uh, from this episode or past episodes. Uh, it's been great. I've been getting a couple of comments uh, today, uh, people commenting on some stuff, uh, some episodes and so forth. So uh, it's been great seeing people going in the back catalog, uh, definitely checking out episodes. Um, I enjoy it. That's literally what I've always said I was hoping would happen is that someone would stumble across the show and be like, holy fuck, there's like 500 episodes and it's been around for forever and I didn't know about it until now. 
that's happening. It's really cool to see it coming to fruition. Uh, it's been really cool to kind of see people cherry picking the episodes when they start resubscribing uh, or subscribing, I should say, to the the channel uh, to see what they're going through and, and checking out. So keep it all up. Keep sharing it. It is greatly appreciated. And speaking of being greatly appreciated, it has been greatly appreciative of uh, Rockabilia. Uh, also kind of speaking to what they've done for me over the last two months of the surgery. Obviously, they're a paid sponsor, and that has helped tremendously in my time down. So huge thanks to them. Head on over to rockabilia.com. Check out their online store. They're doing so many cool things right now. I talked about it in the episode that came out on Sunday uh, where they're doing all these like Halloween collabs with Attila, with funeral portraits, uh, Ghost. Um, I know there's a few more I'm forgetting, but doing all kinds of crazy things. Obviously, uh, someone recently did like the Lava Lamps with different bands. Uh, just doing a lot of really cool collaborative stuff with uh, new and uh, updated bands. Um, just one of those things where, and like I, like I said, I know something is coming very soon. Can't talk about it yet, um, but I know it's probably going to really get people hyped. Uh, and I'm excited to see what else is going to come out of this thing. Um, but for the time being, I'll have to keep my lips sealed. But go on over to Rockabilia, support them for supporting the show. Use our code BRUTALLY at checkout. Take 10% off your total purchase order and support them for supporting us and for the Brutally Speaking podcast. I am John, and I will see you all next week with Craig Mabbitt from Escape the Fate and Dead Rabbit. Uh, that was a really fun, quick chat. Uh, not six hours. <laughs> so uh, come back and enjoy that one, and I'll see you all then. <laughs>